Okay, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, those uh, that are joining us by streaming or watching it later. Uh, my name is Ferdos Karas. I'm uh, chairman and the founder of a media company based in Ottawa, Canada. Um, it's called Chocolate Moose Media, and I basically make media, but uh, media of a different kind, media for social change uh, around the world. And uh, ah, glad to see you join us. Uh, so I will interview you. Introduce uh, you to David Moscato. He is the managing partner of Quarantia Capital in Luxembourg. And uh, I have uh, Alfredo Morales, who is uh, title on, he has many titles, I think, but mm -hmm. one of them is visiting researcher at the MIT Media Lab in the U.S., so the topics that we've been asked, the topic that we've been asked to cover off is a new working class, the time millionaires. Uh, I have told both the panelists that, uh, you know, let's, let's just have a dialogue and let's also be as broad as possible uh, in, in covering the topic, uh, but basically about uh, work and where we see the world going uh, in the future. I've uh, already had two different sessions today on different things, and both of them were talking about uh, Ukraine, of course, uh, since uh, that's the preoccupation at the moment of everybody. But, you know, um, life experience is this whole question about work-life balance. Now, I don't actually like the term work-life balance because, to me, Work is part of life, uh, and uh, it sounds very odd uh, to have uh, a term work-life balance. But having said that, in North America, in particularly in the U.S., they have what is called the Great Resignation going on right now. Um, the Great Resignation, where people are leaving their jobs, and I think. That also is a term I don't like because it's not the great resignation. It's really a great re-evaluation uh, by each individual as to what they want to do. And obviously in the last two and a half years, let's say, with COVID, everything has changed. I mean, literally everything has changed around the world. So uh, we have all gotten used to working out of our homes and not going to an office and so the old paradigm, I mean, unless you're, you're doing something physical, like you have to be somewhere, like, for example, a, a bus driver who can't actually work at home. Uh, but for the most part, uh, many of us around the world have changed the way we work uh, because we are working from home. I know many people who, uh, who have simply said, look, work is not as important to me now. Now that we have had first a shock of COVID, uh, which obviously nobody anticipated and nobody could think of uh, in, before it started, and, and the shock of the last two years and the way it has changed uh, our perceptions and our lives. And now more recently, particularly in Europe, if you're in Europe, the shock of a war that is happening in Europe for the first time in the last, whatever, 50 plus years, almost 60 years, we have not really had a war yet. Some people think, of course, we had a war with the breakup of Yugoslavia, but in general, we have not had this kind of war uh, for quite some time in the middle of Europe. And Europe, and people don't understand this, but if you take history, Europe has had more conflict than any other continent in the, in the world uh, throughout history. There's no question that Europe has always had more conflict than any other continent by far. Uh, none of the others came close. So now we have this other shock. And I think that what these two shocks have done, the COVID shock and now the war shock, is to put in people's brains the concept that maybe I just don't want to continuously only work that life is short and that you don't know what's going to happen in life. Uh, and because life is short, 
uh, that people think, okay, I'm going to now do other things than just work. Uh, even if I'm somebody who loves my work, uh, and certainly if I don't love my work, uh, then I need to do things that balance out, that that make me happy. So the question becomes, if we go extrapolate from this in the future, what is the value of work? And is the value of work simply the paycheck that you get? Or is the value of work as an enabler for you to live your life, the whole of your life, and not just uh, not just getting a paycheck and you know being able to buy your house and your car and so on, but is a is an enabler for you to live a fulfilling life, however you want to define that. So in my particular case, I started my company in Ottawa 26 years ago. And I started what I called a hybrid company. And what is a hybrid company? Today, we call it, at least in Canada, I know there are different terms in different countries, but in Canada, we call it a social enterprise. Uh, A social enterprise is basically a company, but has more than an objective of making a profit. And so I started this 26 years ago, but there was no term called social enterprise at that time. So I started it and I called my company a hybrid company, a hybrid meaning that I used to do for-profit work and take the profits from that for-profit media work and make uh, non-profit work. Uh, and so, for example, the first thing I did in a nonprofit was something called the Cartoons for Children's Rights with UNICEF, where we took the rights of children, and, which was in the Convention on the Rights of Children, which was very new at that time. And we animated every single right in it, and we sent it out around the world, and 2,200 broadcasters played it. Nobody, of course, got paid, uh, and that was just a, a social endeavor. And that that is what I've been doing. So I've, I've kind of made a combination company from 26 years ago, which today we would call a social enterprise. So I have never thought that making a profit was the sole objective of a company. And so if I were to get a job tomorrow, uh, you know, in some other capacity or somewhere else, I would not want to like go to a company, go and work there, you know, from say nine to five or whatever the the term is. The difference is that what we have done is that we have brought our work into our domestic lives. So before COVID, I think that what we used to do in the modern era is bring our work home because we had so many screens, whether it's our computer, whether it's our phone, uh, and that we all looked at these screens and sort of engaged in work even outside of our work environment. And now, of course, uh, during the era of COVID, where we have already all worked at home for two years, now it has changed so that there's very difficult, very easy to get lost in your work, to not make a difference, to not shut off, uh, to not stop. Uh, But on the other hand, it's also very easy to basically uh, not engage in work full time. So that if you working from home and you you have, you know, you have to take uh, um, half an hour for your child or whatever at home, It's much easier now to do that because uh, you can just simply shut off your computer or whatever. You don't have to drive home from from your office uh, and you don't have to you don't have to go back to the office after taking care of your child for half an hour in that example. So I think that 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 paradigm has changed and and our whole idea of work and and what else we do and how we go through our life has changed first with the COVID shock uh, and now more recently, I think, with the with the conflict that's going on in Europe and with this concept that people have that, you know, life is precious and life is short 
uh, and that we should do as much as we possibly can uh, to to have a fulfilling life. And that doesn't necessarily mean just working for a paycheck. So that is my little introduction uh, to the topic. And I will now pass it over to David to take it further from there. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this. Well, um, in our side, we are a company for profits in the sense that we are focused on uh, venture capital and uh, hospitality investments. And uh, we must say that during COVID uh, time, we see, uh, as you described, uh, a change uh, of the paradigm. But So some people enjoy to be at home because of the flexibility. Uh, some others then stay at home, give them more freedom to think about, about their life and their life, how to change their life. The, and we saw a booming about new startups, uh, about uh, uh, people that uh, are looking to enjoy the time to have this uh, autonomy and flexibility about uh, my job. Why I cannot uh, do this in different way? Uh, so... Uh, to comment on this, uh, I will say that uh, uh, there was uh, some uh, some uh, research that uh, emphasized in the big four, for example, uh, that uh, some key learnings uh, during the pandemic was uh, that uh, increasing on digitalization, so people have to get uh, used and know a lot about uh, uh, digital infrastructure, uh, like using. Uh, tools like we are using right now, so uh, Zoom and other type of conferencing. Uh, so, and this has become a sort of happy learning compared to the uh, an obligation from uh, your employer to learn uh, the technology. And the other side, uh, uh, there was, uh, in terms of management, the people, uh, so there was a sort of booster of trust where uh, you allow people more discretions and more control uh, and they're over their work. So actually, get better performance, outcome, product, productivities. Uh, this uh, another point was, uh, for instance, uh, uh, family friendliness and work-life balance. So autonomy give more control to adapt to uh, work and to other sphere of life. And uh, autonomy and flexibility certainly leads to extra time that uh, can be spent to work more or to take care of, or to develop other skills. And uh, that was mentioned before. I must say there's also a negative side. Uh, that you point out before, with that, uh, for example, majority of professionals f- uh, felt uh, more obligated to work after hours, according to the Corn Ferry survey, for example. Uh, so uh, another point was uh, a game changer towards uh, a better environmental footprint. Just to give an example, a reality like Luxembourg, where you have uh, almost 350,000 people commuting to come to work, uh, they uh, measured that uh, there was 72% of CO2 emissions uh, less because uh, 72% of, of the CO2 uh, are originated by commuting to the office. So that uh, was a really a big impact in terms of environmental. And this uh, also going more into for profit. Uh, we see that uh, uh, strong demand of uh, uh, ESG investment, this uh, environmental, social, and governance investment that was pushing a lot during this period because of this uh, sensibility about the people, about a better life, a better quality, uh, a better environment, it becomes uh, an important topic. Indeed, uh, this is a sort of uh, front of mind global topic, so even for clients, for example, in wealth management, which uh, uh, an increasing uh, rate of high net worth individuals or millennials are driving uh, and pretending that from different, different players, from banks to uh, fund manager and so forth, to focus on this cluster of investments. So uh, this is, was also originated by this uh, during this pandemic. Before, before there was just uh, uh, some discussions, and now it become a, a pressure, but not only from, from starting from, from the uh, consumers or from the people up to the government. Okay. Thank you, David. Alfredo, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? It's, is everything working good? Yeah, thank you. Sorry that I joined a little late. I had a little bit of issues. Um, I'm so bad with technology. I work with technology, but I have to be honest, I am the worst. So 
Yeah, thank you for the introduction. And you know, uh, uh, Firaus, you introduced two important topics here. Uh, first is the complexity of the world that we are living in right now, right? And that's uh, my area of specialty, which is complex systems. And it's a discipline of science that studies precisely how different parts in systems, they can be social systems, but also biological, depending on the application, how different parts come together, interact with themselves and with the environment and generate properties, emergent properties of the system that you cannot explain by looking at individuals in isolation. You need to see how they come together and how they are relating to one another. And the truth is that the complexity of any system depends on two components, and I will add a third one, which is the number of parts, the capacity for these parts to create relationships and interactions, and the technology in the case of social systems. It's a huge, huge enabler. And what happened is that in the last 20 years, 50 years, I don't know, I mean, you can't, this is an historical progression, which we have unlocked, let's say, a huge amount of complexity in the world. So now something that happens in another country, a remote area, social disruption or whatever, now gets visibility across the entire globe. And it, it can unleash protests in other countries that before would just be too isolated from one another and the, the influence uh, wouldn't be so easy. And in the background, what's happening is just a huge amount of uncertainty. So we have no idea what the next trigger can be. Like Nassim Taleb, his work is very good on, on explaining these extreme events and the emergence of these extreme cases um, on the loop of Black Swan or Antifragile. And for uh, decision-making um, and for uh, policies and for managers, it's really about how to make decision making and how to operate in uncertainty because despite having millions of experts saying you know all kind of predictions of what can happen or not a mood of a dictator you know in a bad day it's completely random it can trigger you know a global cascade and that's the thing about the current war that things that used to be isolated now can become global so we have these global events disrupting countries and economies and it will continue to happen because it's the world that we're living in. So rather than trying to control for that, we should learn how to cope with that and how to make decisions without decisions in uncertainty, with, without having, a, let's say, falling into the mistake of trying to predict what the scenarios are going to be like, because in reality, we have no idea. We have no clue of what can happen. So it's just a, a waste of effort. And... Um, what happens is that people generally avoid small fluctuations. People, decision makers, they try to reduce uh, uncertainty. They try to make decisions that, you know, make plans and, and strategies thinking of what uh, they want to have. But in the background, what they're doing is generating the emergence of these black swans because some of these, uh, what's in the unknown just keeps accumulating and eventually um, it can burst. So there are certain principles to do decision-making in uncertainty. One of them, of course, is preparing for the worst, having alternatives, just thinking that uh, whatever you are relying on tomorrow by, might be completely disrupted. And it's about generating options and generating different uh, alternatives to your current models of operation such that you can continue to operate and you can reduce the fragility of your strategies, of your business, of your policies. And this is something that we are learning, um, let's say, uh, the hard way, right? Because events keep appearing. People keep getting surprised by these events. I'm personally, I am Venezuelan. I learned how to live in uncertainty because my country got disrupted 20 years ago. So for us, it's completely, it's normal. But I do see in the, in the industrialized countries, places uh, like Europe or the US where things have been working for a certain amount of time that people simply do not know how to cope uh, with these sort of, of events and with the world that we're living in right now. And it's just going to get worse because it's an historical progression. The world keeps getting more complex and now we can have all this communication and we can have all these uh, different influences and fads and, and disruptive events. So it, it is uh, the world that we're living in and we need to change our mindset 
to adapt and not to, to perish along the way. And with that, I'm going to go to labor because uh, the, nobody saw the labor crisis coming with COVID. People thought the opposite. The moment they're going to reopen jobs, people are going to flood these places because they haven't been working for two years or whatever, this and that. And the opposite happened. And that is precisely complexity because you have incomplete information. You are making predictions without knowing half of the picture, you see? So um, it, it's just part of the same uh, issue. And I, I, there's a lot of uh, reasons because of this, uh, why this labor crisis is happening. We can think of, uh, you know, people trading with crypto and NFTs all the way to stimulus to whatever. I don't know. It's just too much for me to, to, to point at something. But there is something that is there in the background that I can point, which is um, a managerial problem. There is a managerial problem here. Which are the, co the, the, the sectors that are getting the most uh, affected by this labor crisis are generally manufacturing labor that, you know, it's not necessarily the most qualified, um, let's say, in terms of studies and stuff. And it's places where people are really not really treated with a lot of dignity. You know, so if people say, well, I'm not going to go back to that crappy job. It's not that they don't want to go back to work. They don't want to go back to those jobs. And the, and the solution really is for or starts by redefining and understanding what the real role of managers and bosses is, because um, uh, someone, an entrepreneur, is somebody that, you know, has this vision of, of his life and has a vision of, of what they want to accomplish in life. And they find the money, they find the resources, they find the people to go for it. Now, the people who are joining a company, they are putting aside their own, the time to follow their own dreams to couple to somebody else's dream. So what a boss could do or the role of the leader should be an enabler such that the people who join their projects also can find satisfaction in what they do, also can find purpose and meaning. Like Viktor Frankl said, meaning comes when you, uh, uh, you, you provide meaning, the meaning of life, according to Viktor Frankl, is when you provide purpose to your suffering, when you provide purpose to your actions. So if you think of work as something that is unpleasant and a pain in the ass for everybody to just go and do, you know what I mean, uh, all these repetitive tasks, it all depends what you're getting from it. If all you're getting is a paycheck, you know what I mean, and, and really you find no purpose and no meaning uh, in your activity, then it's going to be very easy that you disengage and at some point uh, not, not go back, you know, and, and follow your dream. But, you know, like uh, there are companies, and we help companies do this, to create the environment for people to find um, satisfaction and, and purpose and meaning in, in the things they do. And our clients are food industry mostly and manufacturing CPG. And it's, it's about giving back dignity to people, treating them well, you know, and including them in the equation, giving them responsibilities, not make them feel that they're being used, but the opposite, you know, like actually bring them on board and making them part of the big picture. And it's, it's not a, a simple task, you know, it's a philosophical issue behind of what the role of uh, managers and, and the role of employees are, but it is the way to go, especially nowadays. Uh, it's, it's crucial for, for businesses to understand that there is a, a, big, di a, a big difference in how they've been operating regarding, regarding their people and how they should operate. In, in a very good book called From Good to Great, they make an example of, I think it's an... Uh, it was like a metallurgic uh, industry. I don't remember exactly the name of, of the company, but they used to pay college to their to their employees for the kids of the employees. So, uh, as part of the benefits, you know, like we will take care of your college, the, your kids' college, and people would love those jobs. I mean, you know, they, they would give like something that is extremely valuable uh, for them, and it's this kind of like little things, you know, like make a huge difference. And at the end, you get a more robust company with people that are engaged, that care for the business because they're all benefiting from it, not just being used like a machine, you know, that uh, if you take a piece out, you just put another piece in and that's it. It's not the case. It's a social system. It has a bunch of complexity firms and you can drive that complexity towards your benefit 
to increase engagement, to reduce turnover, and to make a, a, to make it a place for people to find a deep satisfaction in their lives. And I think with that, the, the whole life and work discussion ends because really in life, you know, like we need to find purpose in our life. And, and that's something that's written all over the place. It's been written for thousands of years. It's the most important thing in life is to find your purpose. And work is the venue to facilitate this process. But it needs to have the involvement of the managers because it's not something that is going to just happen. It will happen for some people, for sure, you know, but it's not something that is going to happen at the system level, especially at the economy level. So those are our two cents in the topic. Thank you very much, Alfredo, and thank you, David. Uh, both uh, very illuminating uh, opening statements. Before I ask some questions, uh, let me tell uh, the people listening in that you are more than welcome, you're encouraged to ask questions. If you want, you can type uh, the questions or uh, you can even take the mic. Uh, I will give you the mic. Uh, I encourage uh, active uh, participation. So having said that, uh, before I, uh, I, if we don't have any questions coming, let me ask a general question. I think all three of us have touched upon the role of technology and the way technology has been changing our lives. Um, and you're quite right, uh, Alfredo, when you mentioned, you know, uh, what happens in one country. I mean, I, I am completely preoccupied with watching the media side, not the physical side, the media side of what is happening in Europe right now. And to give you an example, I think that probably not many people had heard of the president of Ukraine's name or, or knew what he looked like, like but all of a sudden, everybody knows his name and everybody uh, knows what he looks like. So um, the role of technology has certainly changed. And, and some people say that it has brought the world together. And I'm in one of those camps uh, where I think that the world has become a smaller place simply because we can communicate with each other uh, instantly, uh, regardless of where we are in the world, we can interact with something that's happening uh, halfway around the world in real time uh, instantly. On the other hand, there are people who say that technology has actually moved us a further apart, uh, that uh, we, we are more divided, uh, the world is more divided than at any time in, in history. Um, there was a panel on harassers just recently that I, uh, I watched where they were talking about the extreme divisions in the U.S., for example, uh, in the political system of the U.S. And, uh, and technology does not facilitate a dialogue in that case. Uh, uh, it has not brought people together. So what are your thoughts about the role of technology uh, going forward uh, from this point on? Is it uh, bringing the world together overall? Is it uh, dividing us? Uh, is it making us easier, Alfredo, to cope with the complexity of the world? Or is it because technology exists the way it does, is it adding to uh, our information overload and the complexities that we have to deal with? So, David, why don't you start us off on that? Uh, yes. Uh, well, in terms of technology, I would say technology can be used on different ways. Uh, uh, so it can be manipulated. Uh, so we see a lot of fake news, uh, not only now, but also in the past. Uh, and uh, so for political reasons, whatever. Uh, but uh, technology is certainly going back to the topics that we are here. Uh, I think that it was extremely useful to make people create awareness about the job opportunity that before they were not even realized. Think about people that, uh, uh, Alfredo was mentioned about trading with the crypto, but not all, think about people, for example, that uh, set up their own uh, e-commerce shop uh, by just uh, buying goods from another, I don't know, uh, Amazon and they resell it just with creating their own Shopify. Or other people that are using social media like Instagram or Facebook to sell, uh, to create sort of ambassador program or reseller programs uh, of this kind of related marketing. Uh, others, for example, the booming of education online. So this kind of uh, 
uh, courses, uh, psychological, whatever. Uh, it was uh, that to make uh, people uh, millions of dollars even in a few weeks. So uh, there is uh, uh, certainly technology uh, is enabling people to become, uh, to think about different way of working uh, in different parts of the world uh, and be free. And so that uh, uh, even myself, for example, during the pandemic, I was uh, moving in 10 different countries uh, during the year. Uh, so uh, saying that, uh, um, Technology is for sure, it's, uh, it's improving life and style, but it's improving uh, the awareness about what's going on in the world. Uh, so in this sense, yes, you become more aware and, 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 and also there could be a confrontations and also a different dialogue. On the other side, uh, we need to be careful uh, on the t- uh, who is running the communication. So if there is a, a free players, uh, for example, in social media, like, I don't know, Google, Facebook, and Instagram. So uh, this can be uh, sort of dangerous about uh, uh, the transparency the, the, and the, the freedom of, uh, of the people. We see also issue with Twitter in the past. So uh, this uh, control of the information is another uh, issue that needs to be uh, taken into consideration in the future with this explosion about technology. Okay, thank you, Alfredo. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, there, there is something very important to understand about technology, and it's that it, um, it completely changes the picture. You know, like once you introduce a piece of technology to the system, you don't know which function that piece will have as it interacts with the environment. And as a telecommunication engineer, all I remember from my college days were this was originally intended to do this, but this is what it does, you know what I mean? And, and nobody really knows what's going to happen. I always put the example of mobile phones and taxi drivers. At the beginning, they were the most enthusiastic about the mobile phone because you could call them and they would go anywhere. But then Uber arrived, you know, and it became their enemy rather than their friend. So really, technology plays this role uh, in the environment, which is like an interplay in which it finds its own function and it changes and, and, and it, it enables, it opens up the, another part of the space of possibilities, which is what makes it unpredictable to know about the future. We don't know what's going to happen in the future because there could be a new app that completely changes things that we have no idea that that thing was going to exist or how it's going to exist, um, first of all. Something that has happened with Internet, and this is a very nice uh, study that I came across recently, is that people think that internet will bring everybody together, right? Everybody can talk, everybody can share news, everybody can interact with everybody. However, it has been shown that, and this is going to be a bit technical, but I'm going to explain it, the entropy of, in, of the of internet has reduced. And this means that very few companies are centralizing most of the traffic. So you have this technology that enables all-to-all communication but in reality, the dynamics is pointing towards an extreme centralization of uh, information flows through social media, through uh, some apps. We all know, you know, uh, I don't know if you watch Mr. Robot, you know, but it's like eCorp you know, <laughs> it's out there and it's a bunch of them. But anyway, and, and this is important to understand because uh, something is the perception that we have of reality. Another thing is reality itself. A story that I did, uh, while uh, researching at MIT, we were looking how information flows in cities, and we saw that the segregation of homes that happen by race and by um, income reflects also in a fragmentation of the way information flows, because you talk online with your friends, mostly and with the people you know, and those happen to be, you know, in, in the areas where you live, and etc. So, uh, the online world mirrors in many ways the offline world um, in this regard. And, and that comes to the question whether we have become more fragmented or less fragmented because of technology. There's people who claim one thing. There's people who claim the other way. Um, I think it's very hard uh, to understand this because it's very hard to measure what we had before it, you know. Uh, I always think, well, you know, two world wars happened and a uh, Berlin Wall, you know what I mean? The world was already split before we had Instagram or Twitter or whatever, and, and, and in a large scale as well. So it's hard to say 
um, to claim some of these uh, facts. But it is true that technology provides a window to observe that split, you know, and to see whether it's uh, becoming, those silos are becoming more closed or not. To blame it on technology, I don't know, because there is a ton of things happening simultaneously. Like I said, the complexity of the world right now is too big, and we receive uh, influence from uh, commercial networks, from trade networks, from information networks, and, and, and from a lot of things. So it, it's hard to, to point whether it's internet that it's creating polarization. Indeed, polarization is rising. My country was one of the first, actually, to get extremely polarized. But after Venezuela, many countries just follow the example, you know, and, and continue. And I think that in a large part um, is because when you have a, an environment who's, that, which complexity is just getting stronger and stronger and stronger, you need to simplify this view. You need to simplify uh, reality. And I think it's the process of oversimplification of reality what's actually drifting people apart. So if you say that you are pro X policy, immediately I assume that you are from this party, that you are in this and you are in that. And then even I get surprised if you are not against or favor all the things that people from, you know, that cluster, you know, we are boxing people all the time, boxing, boxing, boxing. And boxing people and boxing, it's, this is categorization. This is something that, uh, you know, has a philosophical basis from Plato even. You know, it's something that it's, it's a long way. It's, it's been a long way that we've been trying to box and categorize reality. But reality is fuzzy and it's dynamic and it's complex and it's interrelated. So these, these boxes at the end, they are fragile. So what I see, what worries me further from polarization is the fragility that it creates because it's an oversimplification of reality. And right now we need the opposite. We need to understand um, how to deal with it rather than, than omitting uh, important information. At the end, the solution for this is communication. And it's the quality of communication. Okay, thank you. Um, if uh, anybody has a question, you're welcome to ask it. We have about uh, seven minutes left. Uh, but in the meantime, let me uh, throw out another question to all of us. Um, and that is, I read a report recently. I don't know if it's true. I'm only the messenger. Uh, that in the next 40 years, the world will gain more knowledge than it has up to this point in history. Meaning that in the next 40 years, we will gain more knowledge than we have from the beginning of time recorded history up to today. Now, that would mean, Alfredo, I think that that means that the world becomes a lot more complex with a lot more knowledge and a lot more difficulty in communicating to each other and, in, as you say, in coping uh, with uh, what is happening in the world. So let me ask you, if you were to be a futurist for a minute, you were to say, okay, what is, I'm going to the sort of forecast in the, maybe not 40 years is too long, but let's say in the next 10 to 20 years, what would be your forecast uh, going forward? David, why don't you start us off on that? Well, this difficult question, so I must say. Um, it's difficult uh, to say, but uh, for sure, uh, this kind of... Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, moving to space, uh, this is something that uh, uh, be present in different uh, places at the same time. Uh, now we are doing this uh, through uh, these tools uh, that like, like this one. Uh, in the future, maybe it will be more uh, um, interactive, I would say. Like uh, think about metaverse, you know, that there's big discussions about it. It's 3D. Uh, so these interactions uh, become some sort of uh, strongest than, than just, you know, uh, video that we have right now, so, so to speak. Uh, so uh, there is already some, 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 some training uh, that uh, some companies and banks are doing uh, using uh, Web3.0, for example. Uh, so 
this is uh, participations uh, uh, through uh, these uh, 3D dimensions uh, that will substitute your need to be present in some country, for example, for a board meeting, so the funds in New York, right, to be in London. Uh, so, uh, and because of this, uh, some, some legal implications, for example, uh, the moment uh, uh, substance for the tax reason, uh, there was some waiver about uh, this meeting, formally meetings, let's speak about the fund business, for example, uh, where you had to uh, be in person. And there was this kind of way. So in the future, there will be this, uh, I think, uh, the, the, this uh, sort of uh, uh, make yourself available in different spaces at the same times and more interactive. Uh, so this is a movie, if you remember, this uh, avatar uh, will be something more useful uh, with different kind of implication, more more real, I would say. Okay, Alfredo, we have uh, four minutes. Four minutes. So, you know, there is a principle called Lindy, the Lindy effect. And it says that if a piece of technology has been around for a certain amount of time, the most probable will continue for the same amount of time. So in the future, I'm sure we'll continue to use forks and we'll continue to have a phone, regardless of how that phone would look like, if it will get you into a 3D world or not. But, you know, you will have that little device. It has survived. And... Um, and, and in a large part, who knows? Honestly, I'm embracing uncertainty right now. Who knows? I have no idea. But there is, there are trends, and we can see trends, right? And there is one a particular trend that I want to bring uh, to the discussion, and you're saying about knowledge. And they say that YouTube, for instance, is helping athletes improve incredibly because they are seeing, you know, like tips and this and that from people that are the best of the best of the best. So. Now you don't have to depend on your local gym coach, you know. You can just go online and see all these experts giving you all these little tricks. So definitely um, expertise in areas, it's going to get way, way deeper um, up to another level because the educational uh, capacities that uh, these technologies have is just incredible. Now, who knows what tomorrow is going to look like. I hope the world is not split in two again. I think the risk of having a, a world split into a Western and an Eastern side is very high. I think the risk of having two internets that are not talking to one another is also very high. And um, it, it all depends on, on uh, the, the unfolding events that we are witnessing um, at the moment. So um, there's a huge uncertainty there of what's going to happen. Well, I would agree with you, and particularly, for example, with artificial intelligence and and how much artificial intelligence is going to take over our jobs, which is actually, you know, the topic that we are discussing and how AI is going, robots and others are, are going to uh, displace uh, working people uh, and the way we are working and the way we are uh, interacting with each other is going to be fascinating. Well, uh, we've come to the end of our time, so I would like to thank both of you, David and uh, Alfredo, very much. Uh, I always enjoy uh, the Harassus conferences. I've, I've uh, now spoken or chaired at many of them, and I, uh, I very much enjoy them. So thank you for sharing your expertise today uh, with uh, the audience, uh, and enjoy the rest of the Harassus conference to all of you. And thank you for all of you who have uh, tuned in and listened to us today. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.